Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. We have so few guests that have experience with children and children and co-parents all in the same conversation. And isn't this the most difficult aspect of getting divorced when you have children? We are very lucky to have Dr. Lynn Meyer, psychotherapist, on the program today. And Lynn, I am so happy that you're going to talk about how to be amicable, how to be amicable co-parents. You're going to talk about some myths surrounding uh, children and therapy. We're going to talk about the court system because you have so much experience uh, in family therapy, in court, in reunification therapy, in co-parent therapy. Wealth of information. I wish we had 35,000 hours, but we're going to do our best in the hour that we have. Lynn, thank you so much for coming. Hi, nice to meet you. Of course. So let's talk about the one, let's start with amicability. We have a divorce. Obviously, people are getting divorced because they don't get along. Perhaps they haven't gone through what I call the emotional divorce yet, meaning healing. And you can please address that <clears throat> as a valuable step in the process of getting divorced towards amicability and then the children. So would you please start out in the way you would like uh, helping people once they decide to get divorced moving forward if they have children? Um, I have a lot of passion about trying to work towards the aspiration of being amicable because I think once you go down the unamicable part, there is tremendous suffering for everybody involved. And it usually does involve court and many experiences in court and many fights and it's never ending. So I understand that during a marriage, if a marriage broke down, it's for reasons that people were not getting along, they were fighting, they were upset with each other, maybe there was a betrayal. And how hard that transition is to then go, I got a co-parent, I am now going to amicably co-parent with this other person who I may not like, or I don't trust, or hasn't been kind to me, and refocus actually on the kids and what is in their best interests. And and I know it's hard, and I've seen it in many cases, but that is the task, to do that, to not punish the other parent through the children, to try and reasonably cooperate, and just little by little, systematically work with that other parent so the children don't struggle because they go between houses. And they feel the tension. They feel the struggle. And it does affect them, in a, in, not in a good way, in an adverse way. Dr. Meyer, when a child is in the womb and the decision to separate happens at that time, can trauma feed into the emotional makeup of a fetus? Yes because we know that anxiety crosses the placental barrier. And as a trauma therapist, children that are early, early infancy, you can feel the energy, you can feel the, the children are um, intuiting from the environment. They're like little sponges. So I think the myth is that parents may not think the children understand at a very, very young age, but they do. They know something's wrong. We've all got a brain stem. <laughs> it's neurobiology. We know something's not okay. And very often, kids start to feel more insecure. They are wondering if it's something they can do or it's something about them. And their demeanor starts to change. Their behavior starts to change. They could become more anxious. Very often with kids, I see um, they they have, we call it enuresis, they might start bedwetting after they've already been continent or nail biting or not sleeping or regressing to be a much younger child. And they talk baby talk. 
it's all, sometimes they come in with headaches and stomach aches, which I know is in, a, in their little bodies, that's the way they say that they're feeling tense. Um, I want parents to know that, a, that this is meaningful. And this is a little bit on the next topic, maybe to be able to have an emotional process that's honest with the children. Obviously, you can't tell them everything. Maybe there's some things that need to be protected but they need to understand what's happening, what's changing in the family. I, so I don't think when I listen to parents talk about, well, we want to do the best for our children, I'm not convinced they understand what's the best for their children. How do you address that in co-parenting? Um, I try to go on faith that these are not just words, but then I will ask them what they will do about that. What are the action items? One of the action items, I'm just calling it an action item, is to strive to be focused on the child. Now, the courts say they're child-focused, but they're not that psychologically developed and psychologically minded. But it is child-centered. What is in the best interest of my child? Is it in the best interest of my child to have both parents or the fact that one of the parents is damaging or abusive or a drug addict. Mostly it's okay, unless there's an exception, and there are exceptions, that the child has a relationship with both parents. They're half, half each parent. They identify with both parents. It's like canceling out a big part of who they are. If there is like that part of you is not okay, because it's just like your mother or your father or we don't want to know about that part. That's very hurtful. Puts a child in the middle and in conflict. Well, yes. I, from being a mediator and listening to parents talk about the co-parenting schedule that they, they want to establish, at least you know to start, and the reasons why one parent might want more time with the child than the other, typically it's mom who says, well, I've been the stay-at-home parent, or even if mom works, I'm the one that's fed them, does their schoolwork, picks them up from school. I'm the one that got the flexible job so that I could be with the parent, the children more. Therefore, now that we have two households, I still want to be with the child more. If there are no issues with dad or the other parent, how do you address that? I think I address that, that that's an emotional piece for the mother. If you're talking about a mother or the parent in question, and that I have compassion for the fact that they've done a really good job in raising their child and giving them security. And it's very painful and it's very hard because it's usually like, why should the other parent have time? I did this. He didn't do that or she didn't do that. It's from a place of hostility. It's from a place of, I did everything. Well, they're your kids. They are your kids. And I do understand the resentment, but I really feel that that has to be addressed as a form of acting out towards the other parent so that the child doesn't feel bad about wanting to have a relationship with the other parent. The parent who's the divorced person doesn't want a relationship with the other parent. We, we get that. But that, if that's imposed on a child, I mean, in an extreme case, that child will always feel they're doing the wrong thing. They feel bad. They feel torn. They feel split. They keep secrets. They, they don't want to say what happens at the other house because maybe that's not right, that they had more fun or they got another present or, you know, because it's not met with necessarily like, that's great. It's met with maybe, oh, you, he or she is trying to buy you or, you know, there's some real bad mouthing that can go on. And, you know, I want to say competitiveness at times. So your example, I have a lot of empathy for your example. And I know women like that. I've worked with women. They've really put their heart and soul, but then they've help this child get to where they need to go to. And they need to adjust, hard as it is, to relinquishing some of that to the other parent. Because it's the child that's the most important. If at some point the child 
doesn't feel as comfortable, maybe that will be addressed, you know, in a different way. Wants to spend more time with one parent. And I've seen that happen too. It happens. I too have a lot of compassion for the parent who spent more time with the children, maybe adjusting their career so that they could do that. Lots of compassion and completely understand when that parent says, I'd kind of like to keep things the way they are. Monday through Friday, an example, uh, I would take care of them and then maybe every other weekend you can have them. Well, my response to that, and tell me where my thinking is, because I have to deal with this not as a therapist, but as a mediator, I have to interface. So my thinking was always, well, understand the investment you have made in your children to the point of giving up your career. Completely get that. But the other parent, as much as they may not have been around, comes home at night. The energy of that parent is still in the house, even if that parent isn't as integral on a daily basis as the other parent is. So when that parent now leaves the house, the one who has spent less time, leaves the house and gets another place, that energy is completely gone. That energy has to be reestablished. Do you not think between the co-parents and between each parent individually with their child. What do you think about that? I'm just trying to understand what you mean by the energy. I'm, 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 you mean the presence of that other parent? Right. So the, the clothes of that other parent are there, the things of that other parent are there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that what's, what needs to be recognized is that there's a loss here. The parents are losing their marriage. It's changing. There was a dream that this would be a family and it's changing. But the children who are much younger have to deal with tremendous loss. They don't like it. Generally, I haven't really met a kid that says, divorce, great, love it. Love going to, our... no, no, they don't love it. They seek ways to perhaps bring their parents together sometimes, kids. they One of the things on the amicable right is if I can get parents to have a birthday party together or you know attend a school function together and the kids just love it they don't have to feel split they can just you know so the energy the presence of the other parent while the divorced person wants that gone the kids don't yes they want both parents mostly always and do you know, I mean, there's many, many videos out there and shows about divorce and, and children. Uh, this one by producer Ellen Bruno, Split, and this was done some years ago, and I heard her talk at a, a convention I went to. She interviewed children from ages 5 through 13, only the kids. And she asked them all the exact same questions. What are you fearful of? And they said, you know, losing my friends having to switch schools, uh, moving out of the house, uh, forgetting things at the other house that I need for school the next day. And then they all said one thing at the end. None of that mattered as long as their parents got along. That was them. That's yeah. great. I believe that. I really do. So tall order. So on the road to being amicable, is there a process that you can share with people right now from the time the decision to divorce is made through all those steps you have to take while you're filing, dealing with legal people, and still raise your children? My bias is that I think that that's a time for seeking therapy. The seeking therapy, I know often courts order co-parenting therapy. And that's mostly how they come to me. Co-parenting is ordered. But I think that I actually had a conversation with a lawyer and, and he said, what's, what's on your wish list? And I said, before anybody even says the word court, everybody goes and calms down and does their work in therapy and then decides, okay, could we mediate this? 
Could we just sit in an office with a nice mediator who'll give us breaks and see what we can hash out, what we mostly agree upon before going into the court system, which everybody knows takes forever, it's expensive, it's hard, it's grueling. And it's uncertain, isn't it? Isn't huh? a, and a little bit uncertain, isn't it? Yes, it's terribly uncertain because there's a person called the judge who will then rule on a situation and you have more control in a conversation with your ex-person, with a mediator or with a mediator and a therapist and say like, what are your concerns? What are your wishes? How do you see things? Let's see if these two parties are closer than you know, they think. Once the decision to get divorce is made, and hopefully it's made mutually, hopefully it's not, we have issues in the marriage, it's turbulent, and one person files without the other person knowing. I mean, this does happen. It does happen. Yeah. And, and even for me, I'll tell you, because I file and I mediate, I made a decision recently that I will not file for one person if the other person doesn't know. I made that conscious I decision. That. I respect that. I don't think it ever but works out. It doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. It's like somebody got the jump start, like, you know, they're ahead of the game. Yeah. And that just creates trust issues. Like if that person's going to do that without me knowing, I better step up my game and start lawyering up, maybe somebody more aggressive. I mean, often I've heard parent, uh, uh, people go and they go to like somebody who's sort of more collaborative. And then the other side gets a lawyer that just litigates, goes to court. And then the other person goes, oh my goodness, mine doesn't go to court. I have to change. I have to get somebody who's litigating, who will go to court because we're not going to collaborate. We're not going to mediate. And it's like this race to match each other. I just don't think that when you've never had an experience of being in the court system and going through divorce, I don't think, I think people step into this because they're angry. I'm being, I'm being very stereotypic. I understand. But my experience, which is not, it's quite, it's 27 years of it. I, I, I think that people don't realize what the court system is like that the fight just can get worse. And I have had people that have regretted going to court over very, very, very difficult issues and wished they hadn't stepped into that kind of level of aggression. Like they have the hindsight is twenty twenty. This has happened a couple of times in co-parenting. They go, oh, if we'd only kind of known this was the way we could have gone. And... It's it's wonderful, but they did go through the court system and they found they found out that nobody wins really. It's very hard. No, in fact, I find it odious just the word winning. What are you winning? You're not criminals because you want to get divorced, unless of course you are a criminal by some other means. But just because you don't want you want to get divorced doesn't make you criminals. Of course, it could be hopes and dreams dashed for the other person if one person is more invested in ending the relationship than the other. But life is tough. I mean, things happen to us in all areas of our life that we can't control. So if possible, Dr. Meyer, if possible, before the filing starts, therapy, discernment, discussion for everybody, including the children. Yes? Right. Yes. And I think that's something I want to speak to. I think that... You know, I've helped parents to tell their children um, how to tell their children. You know, it's important to do it together so that you have the same story. And it's important to be as honest you can without saying the other person's bad or the transgressions. And it's important that the parents can handle children's feelings and anger um, and upset. I've had to do it sometimes with 
parents in my office and the kids there and help the parents who are struggling to tell their children. But at some point, it's really important that they know that this is really happening to them because they do fear it ahead of time. They do anticipate it sometimes, kids. And, and then I think it's so important for children then to be allowed time to process it with the parents, to have questions, or in therapy. And kids of a really young age, I've seen kids from three upwards, they know something's up. They may not know all the big words like co-parenting, divorce, whatever, court, but they know they spend a small amount of time at dad's house, for instance, and they miss mom when they're there, or they um, may be told, no, you can't make a phone call to the other parent because there's hostility. No, no FaceTime. Um, Or, you know, this is not uncommon because of, so there's that splitting that keeps happening. And I think that's so important because if children can tell their parent, I really want to call my mom or I really want to tell my dad that I got a prize, whatever it is, the other parent needs to go, that's great. Let's, let's do that. Let's do that. As hard as it is. It's not about you. As opposed to, you know, this is my time. You'll get to see your dad or your mom when you're in two days from now. You know, I, I remember a really heartbreaking story where this dad, I remember this very well because I was seeing a child. Um, he went to Starbucks on Mother's Day, divorced family, and got like a mug and some stuff, kind of candy or whatever. And the kid gave it to the mom and said, Happy Mother's Day. Now, it's the father bought it. It's from the child to the mother. The mother threw it in the gutter in front of the child. That's like, to me, like such a horrible action, message, make the child feel bad, spoil the child's re-entry, transition to the parent, that the mother is, you know, angry and upset and whatever. The kid must feel bad. Kid did feel bad. So those are the kinds of things that I, I, I really like to highlight how bad it can be and how you don't do that. <laughs> you have to work against those impulses. And there are impulses impulses to badmouth the other parent. That's another big no-no. You, you can go scream in the shower. I actually tell people, go do it in the shower. But in front of your child, don't use derogatory terms. And the courts endorse this, of course. And it's hard because like parents have feelings, but they have to watch how much they don't think about how the child is hearing feeling, receiving, and it's putting them in um, discomfort and conflict. It's so hard. I was asking somebody else recently, how do we deal with this phrase, best interest of the child? Lovely words, but to actually put that in action while you as a parent are hurting and suffering and going through fear, reorganizing your life, what what does that sound like? What is, how is that to put your child's interests first? How can you do that while you're in pain? It's very hard. But their child is not getting a divorce. And the the best interest of the child is a court phrase. I think it's remembering that you love your child and recognizing that this is for you when you get out this anger, but it hurts your child. It will hurt your child. There's no question because they don't feel that way about the other parent. Most cases, obviously I've come across a few where there've been some exceptions. I, I, most cases we're talking about where that's not the case. They love their parent. They love both parents and they don't want to choose. Okay. So you have two parents no drug abuse, no, no, no any kind of substance abuse. It's just not working out, not even adultery. 
it's just not working out. Best case would be to together work with a therapist to, to put your feelings, to do what with your feelings? What do you do in co-parenting therapy that calms everybody down and gets them to appreciating each other as human beings again? I think that what I try to do is when I see people, I, I, I recognize and I acknowledge that they are both hurt. They're both hurt. They're both disappointed. I commonly say, you know, I don't play favorites. I, no one's a king or a queen here. You both co-created your marriage. And there were times where you weren't your best selves. And what I'm asking for you to do is own that common humanity, if you will, and find a way to be self-compassionate, but have compassion to the other. And I think that that's really hard and it takes time, but I'm very empathic and compassionate um, to the situation because I know both people are hurting. And I try to be very patient actually, to let them listen to each other's hurt. And that's very, it's a very hard exercise. I bet it is. I bet. I do that. And you said a a second ago to forgive yourself. I mean, there's a lot of blame going on with ourselves, isn't it? How could I not see this coming? Why did I get myself in this situation? How could I have been so blind? Um, there's never been a divorce in our family. This is the first divorce. Culturally, that's, that can be very upsetting uh, to some people. So I like that you said, because I think it has to start with, you just have to forgive yourself first. That's, that's in our culture, taking it even out of the divorce realm. If you look at all the mindfulness and things that we're trying to understand about ourselves as humans, very hard to have self-compassion it's much easier to be compassionate to someone else so the self-compassion that because you wanted to try and you wanted to work things out you may have seen some things i've had a lot of people tell me i saw it i just didn't want to see it i glossed over it there were there were red flags i just didn't like them so i decided to ignore them And, and and people will say and then they start literally saying, I'm dumb. I, I, I can't believe I did this to myself. And that's, that's the part where it's very important to work through that because that's where the anger towards self and then the anger towards the other parent. And sometimes, let me just be honest, towards the children. I, I do want to mention that it's sometimes very hard for parents to be really parenting when they're going through divorce because they feel a diminished capacity, let's just say, or patience, and they're struggling and they're depressed and there's money and there's schedules and there's demands. And then, you know, they're suddenly under the microscope. There's a minor's counsel watching. There's a lawyer watching. There's a court watching. It's a lot of pressure. Or there's a 7.30 evaluation coming up. Someone's coming to check out their home situation. That's if it's gone that way. It's, it's a lot. What do you do in a situation where one parent clearly recognizes that therapy is essential for their child and the other parent doesn't believe in it? Do you need That's the right. other parent's permission to... You see, do. You need you the do. other parent's... Oh, you sure. do need the other parent's permission to do therapy. And unfortunately, I will say, this is where the court is helpful. I was just going to get I, 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 I dig the court for what they don't do, but this is where I as a therapist have had some very terribly difficult cases. Sometimes children being literally removed while the other parents on at the supermarket to another state. It's happened. Yeah, I had a case child like abduction? that. You mean child abduction? Yeah, I had a case like that. Okay. And, 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 and The person, and that's a very extreme example, um, that's where the courts have become really good about ordering therapists. And 
I, I really appreciate that. Good. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that because the, it, it seems to me that the parent who recognizes that therapy is medicine, it's medicine for the soul, it's medicine for the head, the heart, uh, the parent who recognizes that needs help moving that forward. And what would some of the reasons be for the other parent who doesn't want therapy to, to, to turn it down? Some reasons. I think that they feel very vulnerable. They feel afraid. They feel that the things are going to be exposed um, and they're going to be made to look bad or maybe, you know, I, a lot of myth or mythology goes on about therapy. I'm, I'm biased as a therapist. I think it's wonderful. You have a process, you know, you get into it. It's lean into the discomfort. It's get in the muddy waters. But some people have a very different idea about therapy. They're afraid. I think it makes it worse. Right. And they think they will be blamed, don't yes. they? Yes. So let's just say it's a no-fault system and somebody's had an affair. Mm-hmm. That's one way I've seen exposure. Or, or they've been verbally abusive to their child. Or mm. it was a domestic violence incident. You know. Right. So therapy should be your safe zone. So let's reframe therapy. Therapy is not there to hurt anybody. Yes, things must be exposed. Unless they're exposed, you can't address them and move towards correcting them. But therapy is there as your safe zone to work things out. And everybody should, with the right therapist, come out better, do you not think? I, I think so, but let's just say this, in the court situation or in the litigation situation, sometimes they're afraid the therapist is going to be called in to testify. Okay. And the therapist will say things like the child should spend less time with one parent well, than the other? A, refer, a, a treating therapist is not allowed to make those recommendations. Excellent. But, but here's, I could be on the stand and they could say, you know, something about where the child feels happy or safe or comfortable or for what reasons they feel more comfortable at one parent. Maybe it's because the food, they get food or they have somebody at home when they come home or they don't get shouted at. So it gets into more detail, right? I don't, I don't say oh, they shouldn't see the other parent. But through some questioning, things can come out like, well, you know, at this house, they're um, left for four hours after school. And that's hard. The kids express that they don't like that, you know, or there's drinking or, I I mean, there's things that I'm on the stand. So I I ask the child how the child feels. It can come out. And then I can't, I'm not saying, oh, to remove the child from the other parent, but the judge hears all that, thinks about it. And then there's the other issue of just not paying attention. So you have the children, you're in the house with them, but you're working, you're on the computer, uh, you put them in front of the, t- as a parent, you put them in front of the TV set or the uh, video games that they play, you're not present. Why would somebody not be present? Do they, are some people, even though their parents not comfortable as parents or as solo parents? I think that's definitely a good question because there is an adjustment to becoming the only parent in the house and the kids are coming to you for everything. And maybe you have to work on Zoom and make meals and I don't want to sound like sexist, but I'm just saying it could be either, right? Right. And and now you have to like do everything and you're feeling like I'm I'm a single parent. And that I think is really, really important. It's not just a single parent, co-parent. There's two, two different things to get used to. 
Um, and I do think that's an adjustment for a parent. Oh, I bet, especially especially the parent um, that isn't at, at home as much. But I've seen a lot of people, a, a lot of parents say, that's okay, I'll adjust, I'll learn to adjust, which is marvelous. Then the other parent really has to be open to that and give that parent a chance to well, step up. That's hard. And, and here's here, it could be like, oh, there's a very young baby, right? And was the other parent as involved? Did they get up in the night to feed? Uh, is the other parent going to go, they didn't do any of this. How are they going to do it? I, I, they don't like getting up in the night. I mean, you know, there are some valid concerns. And, you know, they're just going to have to, right? The baby's going to cry and they're going to have a very big reality check. Like, okay. <laughs> or, and maybe the reality check is okay. I'm not the best right now at this age to have the children as much as I do. If you're going to be honest with yourself and not make child support the determining factor regarding time, I, I literally hate that that's the issue. I know that's the issue in many cases. It's just horrible to make that the issue. But it, there are very few. I, I kind of have this little phrase like, are they really wanting the 50% time? Um, I have not seen, even if they're like literally not able to, many parents who say, you know, I, I don't think I can do this 50% of the time. It's quite rare. It does happen, but it's quite rare. And, and, then, and then there are parents who walk away. I've seen that happen. And that's really tragic. I, I I remember many years ago, I had somebody who was really at the bottom rung of getting any schedule. This person hadn't done things, had done some pretty nasty things. And the court was saying anger management. The court was saying therapy. The court was saying co-parenting. The court was saying reunification. This person just opted out. I think it was my very first case. They just opted out. I'm, I'm, not gonna. No one's gonna tell me what to do. I'm out. Of, I'm out. And that was painful. Very painful for the children. I had a mediation case um, like nine years ago, quite a while when I first started. We, mom wanted to give more time to dad. Child was nine, so we're not talking an infant. Mom wanted to give more time to dad and Tad refused. He said, I don't mind spending more money. I'll, I'll give you whatever I'm supposed to give you. I just don't want the time. And I said to him, I hope I'm not you know, offending you or putting you on the hot seat, but did you want to become a parent? And he said, no, I did not want it. She wanted it. We weren't doing well. I suggested that we get a divorce. And she said that having a child will bring us closer together. And it hasn't. And because having a child, when you are already close, is hard in and of itself. Raising a child is hard. Raising me was hard. But if you're not doing well as a married couple, and then you introduce this extra layer of work, it seems that you're pretty doomed. Right. But even in that case, if I was the therapist to this man, I would have tried really hard to help him to grow in the mm. development. Not, not necessarily like time, if, if time was more time was good, but to try to have sort of a sense or begin to have empathy and understanding for what a child might want from him. The child now is real and what that would be like for him to open up to that, maybe give a little more or be present a little more even when he was during that time or to just honor the fact that this child hasn't done anything. You see, there could be all that. She made me have this child that could be lingering. And I didn't want it. And it's not the child's fault. It sounds like that's anger expressing itself to mom 
Yes. And that's where it is right now. That's common, right? In these situations, it's people getting back at the other parent and the children feel it and they suffer with it. That's why it's so important. I often say, like I want, I literally say, I want you to fall on your sword now. I need you to just do that for the situation. Apologize. Have compassion. Try. It'll help. It changes the energy in the system. And also with that could be, let me introduce you to the joys of having a child if you maybe change the way you think. Change the way you Maybe there's some fears. Maybe it was a difficult childhood for that parent. Therefore, that's all they can bring forth is, are those issues they still have lingering from the past and can't, can't be a parent yet because they're still a child working out their own issues? Absolutely. And I think that straddles the other area that I love to work in and does kind of work well with this is, you know, if there's been trauma, there is fear. There's always fear. There's fear of repetition. There's fear of a lot of things. And you're right. If a person has had a horrible childhood, many times those people don't want children. They don't want to, they don't want to, they, they will say to me, I don't want to have children. I don't want to do to the children what happened to me. I don't trust that I have enough patience. I still react too much because Unfortunately, with trauma, there's always reactivity unless there's a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Um, so, yeah, it could be trauma for sure. And interestingly, what I've seen is when people open themselves up to a relationship with a child, the benefit and value that you get back from a child's love and respect and connection with you is like no other. No question. And that's the hard part, to get to the place where you can open up to having that relationship feel like it's restoring something. It's allowing you to have a second bite at the apple, you know, in a way, like... It's, but that's, that has to be navigated at a point where there's, you know, the trauma is understood in a very deep way. Let's talk about, if we can, why a child would present him or herself one way to one parent and another way to another parent. I hear quite often when I'm in mediations, and we're dealing with the co-parenting schedule or issues, decisions that have to be made with the children. Well, he told me this when he was with me, that he really didn't like doing this activity, that this was going on in school. And then the other parent says, I get the completely different story. Let's address what's going on with a child when they present themselves differently to each parent. Yeah, I come across this a lot because parents then wonder what, what's, what's going on with the child. If they're having their own thoughts and feelings, that's like, is this coming from the other parent? Uh, I think that what I want to say is I would like to trust that the child is having their own thoughts and pe- feelings. And when I've seen a discrepancy in the presentation, like at one house, I don't want to play soccer. The other house, I want to be on the soccer team. There is a question, there's always a reason. And the reason is somebody doesn't want to pay for it. Somebody doesn't want to drive. It is the child is trying to maybe please or resolve a conflict. Um, I'm not just talking if, about a child. Are you talking about if a child is more misbehaving at one house or the other? Or just has a different message? Well, has a different message. So there are, you brought up a good example. There are school activities. One parent wants the child to be involved in school activities, or the child has said they want to be involved. We'll say, we'll call it soccer. 
the other parent uh, doesn't think that this is as important as um, school studies or other types of things and would rather the child do something else. Or it's the other parent's desire for the child to do this activity and they want to fight with them. That too? That's been very common. Whether it's soccer or dance, I'm now thinking of numerous examples where it's like, oh, it's because you are your parent thing. They want you to do it, right? It's not you that wants you to do it. And this is back to what I'm saying is, if you have a good relationship with your child, they're one person. Ask them how they think and feel and believe them. Where I think it's a slippery slope is where the other parent thinks, oh, they're just saying they don't want them to go to that school or they don't want them to play soccer. So the child's presenting that now to me as if it's their opinion. And then it's worse for the child because they're not believed. Right. Or, or one parent doesn't believe, each parent doesn't believe each other. You're just making this up because what, what he or she says to me is this. Well, no, what he or she says to me is that. Oh, no, no, you're just making that up because you don't want to pay for it. That's, it gets back to the parents arguing again. And my and child's attempt to be a peacemaker. I won't ask for this at this house because it's too hard. I know my mom won't drive me or my dad won't pay for it or whatever. So they take it on. That's the thing. Well, we do have to realize that they're, they're the monkey in the middle and they're being pulled. So they will take it on. But if I ask them in therapy at times, I get to the bottom of what they really think and feel. And it's very painful for a child to not be believed about what they think and feel. And then add to that, that they try to compensate. But this is very real, isn't it? That a child, when they know their parents disagree about something for the child to do, will kind of change their story depending on which parent they're talking to, or they will be misinterpreted to a certain extent. Um, Maybe being tired after an activity is normal, but that doesn't mean they don't want to do the activity again. They're just tired. I also see how they, um, my experience is how safe they feel to share their emotions changes. It depends on which parent or it depends on if they know the parents are conflicted about something. They may not speak about it. They decide to oh, no, it's fine. I'm okay. It's not, they're not okay. They're just trying not to have a fight. They're trying not to be in the middle, in the conflict, pulled. So they don't really get to express how they feel. So when you get people in family therapy, is this where family therapy has its value so that the child can feel comfortable being authentic with both parents separately and not really worry about their parents' reaction. How does family therapy work? Family therapy, I I think, is wonderful in these situations. If two parents can be in the same room and have the concern for the child and to want to talk about, you know, things that are working well, things that are changing, um, they have the opportunity to really hear their child. So like one of the things you do is in the system, you ask every person how they feel about how things are in the family. And, you know, and this is a safe space and you can say, and the child, hopefully the, the kid in question is able to say, this is how I feel. I feel my parents still hate each other or I feel my parents don't believe me when I, say I have feelings or when they disagree, I just try to drop it or, you know, whatever it is. And then the parents have to hear that as how the the child is experiencing them even post-divorce as a family, because it's always a family in some way. And then it's like the next person, how do you, how do you feel? And how do you eventually, how can we change the system? for the better. And I 
usually ask the child, how would you like things to change? What were the things that you would like to change? Everybody gets the, how would you like to change? But I really emphasize it to the kid. Oh, I just want my parents not to fight. And I'll say like, I use a lot of humor. I'll tell parents, okay, write that down. Please take notes, text it to yourself. Your child has asked you not to fight. Can you do that? Can you try? Can you breathe? Can you start meditating? Can you scream in the shower? But your child has requested that you stop fighting. It's too hard. And there's always a lot of emotions, you know, mm-hmm. in that situation. What do you do when you have two different parenting styles? So you're in the same home. And it seems to me, since I was a kid at one point, that my parents had slightly different parenting styles. They weren't hugely different, but they had slightly different ways. And we knew which parent to go to with certain things, that they would be open in different ways to receiving whatever we wanted to say. I had two other siblings. So you may have slightly different parenting styles as you're living together. Now you have two different homes. And one parent says, well, we should have the exact same parenting style. The child should experience. Is that possible? I think, I think it's, you know, there's the co-parenting and then there's this parallel parenting where one household just does whatever they do. They do what they do in different houses. Yes, I do push for like, say it's a young kid, like, okay, what's the bedtime? Eight, eight thirty. Can you guys align? Can you guys align on that? Can you guys align on homework? Can you guys align on um, sugar? I try to get as much of alignment as possible. Um, there are cases where I've had where it comes around that, you know, in one house, the person is quite more, there are three kinds of parenting, right? There's authoritarian, which is somebody's very, the parent is like, I won't say a dictator, but, the you know. Ruler, the ruler, ruler, the decider. Decider. All the rules, and they're very rigid, and these are the rules. And then sometimes you have a parent who's a very opposite, is laissez-faire, which is, oh, whatever they want to do, whatever time they want to go to bed. And so what the most, by the way, those two, Two versions, children are more insecure. This is research. The middle one, authoritative, is you can be firm but flexible. So firm and flexible could be like during the week, you go to bed at 8 o'clock. Okay, on the weekend, I'll let you watch that show. You can go to bed at 9.30. During the week, you don't get video games or TV as much. On the weekend, you can watch your movies, you can play your video games, whatever. So. I tell parents, this is the model that works the best. You can be firm about homework. You can be firm about sugar. You can be, but let's be flexible. Like maybe sometimes we can work on an exception. And the more you align, the more secure your children will be. Um, it's interesting that kids also know how to play the system. Sorry, but they do. Like, they know that at one house they can get more stuff. They can, and that usually aggravates the other parent. The you know. fun parent versus the strict parent. The That's Disneyland, they describe themselves. Disneyland parent. They school Disneyland dad, but I'm saying Disneyland parent. Okay, no, I like that Disneyland dad. But it's true. There is a version where, you know, kids know that they can ask for all these things and the other parent, they know the parent feels kind of guilty so they'll get. What they really want, though, is emotional food. They really do. They want the emotions. They want to be acknowledged. They want to be tracked. Tracking is very important. Tracking is like a term in psychology where the parent is literally like a tracking device. They're aware that their child is unhappy. They're aware that the child is troubled. They're tracking that and saying, how, how, I noticed this about you. Do you want to? Do you want me to? Do you want any help with that? Do you want to talk about it? Can Can I help you? You know, you can talk to me. I know this is hard for you. 
it's it's a lot to deal with and i you know whatever it is tracking with that emotional state that their child is in so children want this children and, even though they may rebel oh my gosh can't you let up no not really <laughs> you're my child so they do like the fact that they like the acknowledgement they're aware of them and what they're doing yeah absolutely I think that's a universal principle of humanity. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be attuned to. We want empathy. We want compassion. This is how our brain grows. Now, if you're in a trauma and you want your brain to settle down, you need that compassion. You need that empathy. You need to know that the other parent is okay enough to help you, literally okay enough, that they're not like falling apart. Mm. And if they are falling apart, they need to go and get treatment and do it in the therapist's office and talk to their friends and get help. But for the child, they need to be as okay as possible. And it's not to say that you can't say to a child, honestly, and I believe in this, you know, mommy's having a hard day today, but what do you want for lunch? Or I'm a little sad. It is very normalizing for a kid to know that parents can also feel things. That's really good to know. That's good to know that a parent can at least minimally just share what a child may notice about them anyway. I feel a little sad today, but that's okay. Let's have dinner. What would you, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah you know let's have a hug. Oh, I feel so much better. And, and, and move on. And, and, and then the child says, oh, I can feel sad too. And I can transition. I can be okay. I can be uncomfortable and I can be comfortable at some point. I want to go back to something you said that I hadn't heard before and I just love it. Emotional food. So, and this came on the heels of me saying to you, how can you address um, the feeling of the stricter parent, the one who really makes sure homework is done, they're eating properly, there's a consistent routine about going to bed, doing chores, all of that, and the other parent, very, very loose. The parent who has more of a structure in which they work will typically say, you know, I believe in what I'm doing, but I'm really resentful that he or she is looked at as the fun parent. It's not, I, so, so I like the fact that you said what they're really looking for is emotional food. I, I guess I first of all don't want the parent who is providing this routine and structure to feel badly because it's needed, is it not? Yeah, and I, would, I acknowledge that. And then I try to acknowledge that at the other house, they get some other things. So the child is balancing that out. And should the parent who has more of a routine know that eventually when the child is older will seriously appreciate the routine and everything that the quote-unquote stricter parent did yeah, I, I, I do endorse that. I do endorse that, you know, the parent that feels like, oh, I'm just the donkey. I, I've heard this from a couple of patients of mine. They've, you know, I just do all the hard work. And the other parent doesn't do anything. And there are cases where the other parent is an alcoholic or just like MIA or busy with women. I don't know. And I will say, Look at how your child is growing. They're understanding how to do their homework. They're understanding how to show up, be respectful. Um, they will, they, they're not going to get it from the other parent. They are getting it from you. Mm -hmm. Like I could be really honest. Like I'll be honest about what the other parent can provide. Let's try to appreciate that. But this is what you're giving. And this is going to set them up well for life. And maybe, you know, there'll be, you know, times where they just want to cut loose and have fun because they've learned that in the other house. 
they'll integrate it. Trust that your child will integrate it. They don't need to fight internally about it. And do children really like the fun parent more than they like the parent who has more of a routine? You know, that's a difficult question. Yes, in the moment they really like it, but I think children want to feel safe. And they do feel safer with boundaries, and boundaries are a really important thing. There's a boundary between them and their parent. There's a way that they can speak to their parent or not speak to their parent. There's a boundary about homework or dinner or activities or whatever. Um, children need boundaries. They don't feel very comfortable when it's just sort of loose and whatever. They feel unsafe. And safety is a big deal for a kid. Routine is a big deal. And it's not because I'm saying be rigid. I'm talking about flexible, firm, you know, rules, routine. Gives a child a sense of um, safety. Like if they go to one house and the homework's done with, you know, the parent and they go to another house and the parent doesn't say anything about homework and just doesn't care. I don't think that, I think the child next day at school when they haven't done their homework doesn't feel too good. Yeah, I was going to say, won't it be reflected in what they do at school if both parents aren't consistent with at least providing something like the homework after after school, after dinner, just at least something like that. Or coming to school late, you know, or things like that. That happens sometimes. Um, so, so there's all these different, you know, there are just really concrete things too. I mean, yes, there's all these emotions, but there's really concrete ways to show the child that they're aware that this is their life and they have to be at school on time or they have homework or they have these play dates or these different things. How many times have I heard a parent say, oh, no, I don't want to take the child to the birthday party. It's my time. I don't like that. Right. It's really the child's time. And by the way, they're spending it with you. But yeah. this is your child's life that you're enacting. Yeah. Before we leave this, I, I want to address the other parent that's much looser, that doesn't like a routine. From what I hear in mediations, A, the one parent will avoid a routine simply to get back at the other parent because their issues are unresolved. And so that's play, that, so they give that issue to their child in the form of, come hell or high water, whatever I say in my house is going to be the right way to parent and I don't care what you do in your house. And so the kid's staying up till nine or 10 and, and, and all this, that, and the other thing. Can we address that parent for a minute and explain how to, how to address the reasons why they're not providing more of a routine? Well, that's a hard one because sometimes it's just like a belief system or personality issue or, you know, they're having maybe sometimes... You could say it's getting back at the other parent, but sometimes I found it to be like they expect the child to just like do these things in a way for themselves. Yeah. Maybe way too too much expectation put on the kid. Or are they depressed? Are they going through a lot? They can't show up as a parent, um, as a functioning parent in that situation. They're not listening to the other parent who's saying, listen, the child's failing math. Can you do math at your house too? Can you make sure the math is done? They're not, they're like, I'm not listening to that person. I, I, I'm, whatever they say doesn't matter. That will affect the kid. You know, I think it changes a lot when the kids know, and I have seen um, unamicable become amicable through very hard work on some parents' part. And when that changes, it's interesting because the kid knows the two parents, despite being divorced, are talking to each other. And it surprises them sometimes after a lot of amicability, so to speak, that dad has just said, oh, can you help her with math? It's not going so well. She's not doing all her math. And it's presented to the child who suddenly goes, oh, oh I, I'm going to have to do the same at both houses. You know, 
it's hard to know what, why one parent is the way, you know, one way or the other way. It's just personality. It's sometimes how you're raised. Um, it's different for, you know. Right. It's two opposites. It's very, so like I said, trying to pull them more to being aligned. If I'm involved as a co-parenting person or therapist, you know, I try to help with that. To end this, I want to go, I want to finish with being amicable because obviously that's the whole point of this. Oh, that saves so much. You know, amicable, I want to say the definition of amicable in this situation is not, I love you. I think you're the greatest. I like you. It's not necessarily that at all. It's, I'm going to be reasonable. I'm going to cooperate with you because I love my child. It's not I love you. We're divorced. I may not love you at all. But if I could be amicable, reasonable, and I'll do the math homework because it's for my child, not because you told me to do it, not because I want to just not do anything you say as the X, X to X. That's what I think amicable is. I'm not like, Butterflies and rainbows, you know, it's not that at all. Oh, now you should love each other because, but no, it's just reasonable cooperation because you love your child. Nicely said. Nicely said to bring it back to center, Dr. Meyer. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is going to be in the show notes, but for those listening right now, how do people get in touch with you? Well, <laughs> Do you want me to give me my phone number or? Whatever you would like. Yes. All right. So um, I am presently working from a home office, which I will, if somebody calls, I will certainly give them that information. Um, my phone number is 310-897-8760. My email is L M E Y E R. Uh, 2230 at AOL.com. Uh, my website is drlynmayer.com. Um, so those are the ways people can get a hold of me. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. So in conclusion, you really do it all. You will work with children, just with children. You will work with just the co-parents and you will work with the entire family. And I work with, and I just mentioned, I'm often appointed as a reunification therapist, which means a child who's estranged from another parent. Oh, okay. So that, that, I just, we didn't talk about this, but thank you for saying I that. I just want to say a quick word about that. That, that, is, that is a whole other area of how that happened. Um, where a child might be estranged or alienated is often the word used from another parent. Now, I want to be very clear. Sometimes it is not just alienation. Sometimes it's through an unfortunate incident where the parent is wholly to blame. And sometimes and often it is through the hostility by the other parent. Okay, so important because depending on the age of the child, if the child has not been with a parent for many, many years and now they're graduating from high school, that's tough. You're a stranger now. Oh, I, I'm talking about really young. I'm talking about alienated could be happen really, really young where, you know, <clears throat> one parent doesn't want the other parent to have any custody. And so in that house, that child is brainwashed yeah. to not like the other parent. Yeah. I, I've watched monitoring visits where the child is calling the father dad, playing with him, and then at the other house, she's supposed to call, he or she is supposed to call the parent by their first name or that person. That is what yeah. I'm talking about. And that's very young. And it starts young sometimes. Okay. So anyway, I, I just wanted to mention 
Well, you know, any one of these things we could do a whole hour on, but I wanted to just get an overview um, of what you do and touch upon some things like the different parenting styles, like um, a, a child being comfortable being him or herself in the same way with both parents. You know, I really, these are the big ticket things that happen all the time. And I, I thank you for sharing your experience, your ideas, and your heart. Thank you. Today. Thank you, so to you. Appreciate it. All right. And I thank all of you for listening, uh, each and every one of you. Please share this with anybody that you know uh, could benefit going through their own co-parenting issues. If you have any topics that you would like to present to me, you can reach me at my email, judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com, judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com. And as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves. Be kind to your spouse and cherish your children above all else.